First of all, I think that um, when I look back at all my past work, uh, whether photographic or video, um, it seems to me that when I analyze it myself, it's always been about this intersection between the self and the social political issues. Um, really issues that I've had to cope with uh, as a single human being on this planet, as a woman, as an Iranian, as someone who had particular life consequences of living abroad and being separate, and yet a, a creating a kind of a monologue, but yet coming into a dialogue about larger issues that are above and beyond myself. So when I look at women of Allah, or when I look at the videos, um, it has a foot in really questioning deeply existential personal issues that really conveys my own anxieties as a human being, and yet always um, taking that into a larger um, arena that really raises much bigger questions about the social, political, and religious issues. Um, and so in that um, domain, when I read um, Woman Without Man um, as a structure, as a story, uh, although I think that the book really undermined the political, historical aspect of the time, it really just mentioned it as a background, it just sort of offered um, a perfect opportunity to once again to create this kind of intersection between the individual lives of women, these few women, as they aimed for an idea of freedom, independence, um, some more um, for rather personal and so spiritual uh, issues, others for more repressive and social issues. And yet the country of Iran at the same time also struggling for an idea of freedom and independence. So, um, and then talking about the orchard as, as a space that was very unworldly and, and sort of mysterious, uh, a place that was not grounded in reality and represented the magic part of the story. And yet the city of Tehran, 1953, that really sort of was rooted in important historical issues of a country. So this kind of sort of paradox in terms of, you know, the, 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 the orchard representing the the sort of more feminine, um, the more ephemeral aspect of the story, the magic of the story, the more philosophical, the more space to really raise much more existential questions. And yet, when you come to the city of Tehran, you're really grounded on history and reality. I love this travel, and it gave me a perfect um, conceptual arc. And then it was the question of how to then develop a story that was sort of interweaving the country's dilemma and plight for democracy and freedom, and the woman's individual plight and struggle for an idea of freedom and democracy. And that itself became a poem for me, uh -huh. but then it had to convey in a narrative structure that people could understand, so that's why it took seven years. But this was my original attraction to the novel. Well, I can say that for me, um, this has been a, uh, an incredible um, experimentation, both in terms of form and the practicality. Uh, in terms of the form, uh, moving from uh, photographic images that are really constructing concepts and images to telling stories. Uh, for me, this was a, a great adventure. Uh, could I really tell a story? Um, and, and I have to say that uh, I, when I look back at my own behavior as an artist, I've been really nomadic and relentless about um, sort of reinventing myself and the need to have a new beginning every time. It's almost like, you know, my nomadic lifestyle and as the way I never feel at home anywhere and I have to constantly move. And this traveling has also been very consistent with my work where I have to do certain body of work and the minute I'm defined by that, I resist it, I, I turn my back to it and I move to the next chapter. Only That's the only way I know how to stay alive, how to stay excited and, and be honest to myself. And so talking about the form, I know that I essentially did it because I wanted to challenge myself and to see could I really tell a story? Could I really have these images move and not just move but uh, really uh, captivate people more than 10 minutes, an hour and a half? Now, uh, there's another fundamental reason about my move to cinema. As you mentioned, there's an activist in me that uh, is very interested in art um, in connection to the grassroots, to the general public, uh, and the fact that the exclusivity of art and the fact that galleries and museums are become very elitist practice in a way, 
um, that even my own Iranian community, for the most part, have never entered the gallery and museum to see my work, but only reproduction. But when I make a film, people actually do go see it. And, and that whole concept of how cinema is more accessible to the general public. Um, and I wondered if I could navigate outside of the galleries and museums um, and, and sort of gain a whole new community of audience. And of course, this was a tremendous risk. Um, I was more likely that I would fail than win. Um, I, I had to work, learn how to work with producers. I had to learn to work with festivals, distributors. And it was really a tremendously um, difficult process. I, I don't mean to say that was a small undertaking. It was one that many times I just felt like I should give up, and I was failing. But I never gave up. But essentially, those were the well, actually, yes. Uh, Shamish Parsipur, first of all, is one of the most uh, respected and celebrated Iranian women authors still living. Um, but sadly, um, she's had a terrible past. She has been in prison a number of times, once for almost five years. Um, and she developed mental illness. She was um, dealt with poverty. She eventually had to go in exile with her son left in the country. So I can't describe the, the degree of pain that she has had to go through because of her writing. Um, and needless, but nevertheless, her work are masterpieces of modern literature. Um, and I have always had an obsession with Iranian women writers. Uh, in, even with the woman of Allah, it was their poetry that was inscribed on the photographs. So um, for some reason, in Iranian culture, we read a lot. Uh, we don't have a visual culture, but we have a literary culture. Uh, poetry is like uh, food for mm -hmm. us. Um, I can't think of another culture that is more, they say there are so many poets in the streets every day. There just, we have more poets than we know what to do with. Uh, it's just the way that Iranian people have been able to cope with their very repressive life and, and censorship. And, and so poetry for us is very special, particularly lit you know, novels as well. So when I decided to make a film, and it was the question of what story would I grab, I started reading a lot. And I went back to looking at Shanush. Um, and then I discovered that actually she's living um, in a small garage in California in absolute poverty and pretty much forgotten. And so I flew to meet her. And I was, um, I have to say that they say artists, there is a degree of madness that takes them to their creativity. And this woman. Um, just blew me away and in terms of the life that she had lived and yet the, the kind of resilience and the, the, the sense of imagination that she still had and, and not at all bitter about the years that she spent in prison or the life in exile, etc. So my um, commitment to this project, and you asked me why I never gave up, was partially because of Shamish Barsipur herself. I felt this incredible love affair for her and devotion and, and I felt like I have to make this film, even if it is for her. To make the story short, I mean, we became very close friends. She moved to the East Coast. She actually performed, if you saw the film. She's the uh, madam in the brothel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was her first acting role. And, and she was very close to us, and she still is. Um, and I have to say that um, the film did bring back to her some attention. But she's doing quite well. She, she's still writing, although she's under a lot of medication. Um, but it's been a, a really a great honor to know her.